Uh, my name is Adam Novak, uh, and I'm here today to talk to you about uh, the project I've been working on called the Human Genome Variation Map uh, at the UC Santa Cruz Genomics Institute. Uh, so most of genomics right now is done in this, why is it yellow? <laughs> it's very yellow. Uh, <laughs> But it, it's done in this sort of linear, linear framework, right? So you have the reference genome. There's just one. Uh, and all the genomes that people, people work on are analyzed sort of with reference to it. Uh, but that, that, that's worked pretty well so far. Um, but now we are getting into the era of the sort of on the order of $1,000 genome. Uh, sequencing is getting cheap. Uh, and so we're getting more and more genomes, and we're starting to see ways in which that abstraction doesn't really work. Um, mostly they manifest in this way. So this is a, a picture of the UCSC genome browser looking at the uh, major histocompatibility complex, which is a very variable genomic region to do with the immune system. Um, and... <laughs> So you can see here, there's all of these. Th this is sort of an alignment between, so you have your, your reference defines the space, and then there's the different uh, alt loci that are present in the GRC H38 assembly. So these are like different versions of the region that are distributed with the assembly. And you can see that all these different versions are sort of very different from each other. There's a lot of big gaps in this multiple sequence alignment. And everywhere that they are aligned is just like completely red with these little red lines that indicate SNPs. So when you, even when you zoom in down here, it's maybe not quite so red, but there's still a lot of SNPs, way more than you would expect in, a, in an ordinary region. And there's some, some versions just don't have this like two kilobase region that we're looking at. Uh, there's a lot of variation out there. And even though sort of most of a genome is mostly the same between people. We found now there's 187 different places in the genome that are sort of like the MHC, where in the GRCH38 uh, assembly build, they're distributing these alt loci sequences uh, that give alternative versions of that region. And it's really hard to incorporate that information into analyses when we're doing the analysis in this sort of linear paradigm. Uh, Here's just another data point for why we need to incorporate variation. Uh, this study uh, done by all these people, including the very famous J. Craig Venter, uh, decided that, or concluded that, on average, sort of each genome that you sequence uh, carries about 0.7 megabases of genomic material that's just not in the primary assembly, the linear reference. And that material can be getting ignored. So the conclusion to this, like Eric was, was talking about, is we want to add variation to the reference. We want a reference that includes variation. Generally, we would do this by using a variation graph. Uh, so Eric showed you a little bit about this, but just to sort of uh, reiterate the, the model that we're using here. Uh, the pieces of sequence are nodes, and then these nodes are connected by edges that connect from one side of one node to another side of another node. So from here, this, this edge goes from the right side of this node to the left side of this node. So you can do various things in this structure. You can put nodes sort of in alternation in parallel. So this represents a single nucleotide polymorphism. Some people can have A, some genomes can have G, and you sort of continue on to here. Uh, but we also have a more expressive power than that. We can, uh, we, we can draw inversions, so you can go through this A either forward or backward, following these other edges, and we can also do duplication. So you can go through this G as many times as you want, going around this loop uh, to represent a duplication of that G node. And, and the whole system is backwards compatible to the linear reference structure, because in this uh, graph we can embed paths that describe uh, the sort of linear reference that people have been using so far and say what nodes you have to visit in order to spell it out. And we can convert annotations back and forth using these paths. So the project that I'm working on, the Human Genome Variation Map, 
uh, is a project to try and replace the linear reference with a reference based on a graph so that we can all do wonderful graph-based genomics, which is much cooler than boring linear genomics, and will incorporate more variation and have uh, various benefits like uh, lower allele bias, like Eric was telling you about. Uh, so eventually we want to build a big whole genome graph reference that we can sort of distribute as an artifact. Uh, and we want that graph to include all variants that are at 1% frequency in any population sort of as a, as a first cut of what variants we want to include. And our strategy for getting there uh, is based around this idea of combining various data sources. So we want to pull in the uh, GRCH38 reference build with the linear reference and also with these uh, alt loci sequences that give sort of alternate versions of things. And we want to pull in the thousand genomes variants because that's a really big database of variation that took a lot of work to make and we want to benefit from it and we want to pull in some of these newer variant compendia like the Simons Genome Diversity Project and its data set of variants that sort of from more populations than thousand genomes surveyed uh, and we could pull in Illumina's Platinum Genomes data that sort of goes deep on a few genomes. Uh, but that all sort of describes a very hard project. Uh, so for my PhD thesis, I decided to work on an easier project, which was to build the chromosome 22 variation map as sort of a validation of this idea that we can build something like this and to sort of demonstrate that the tool chain to build this thing can be built and that it works. Uh, so my goals were to combine data from multiple sources, maybe not all those data sources, but a, a couple. Um, and yeah, to implement the pipeline that is needed to do this and to show that it can work. And the tools I used for this were, number one, uh, Eric's VG system, which we've been working on, uh, and number two, this uh, tool we have in our lab called TOIL, uh, which doesn't really stand for anything, that's just what we call it, uh, and it's a parallel workflow manager, so we can take uh, software like VG and distributed out over public clouds like Amazon or like Microsoft Azure uh, and we can also run stuff sort of locally on our cluster resources. So using uh, VG and Toil I put together this pipeline uh, that sort of demonstrates that you can combine data sources and build uh, a graph of the right sort to be a reference. Uh, so I started with GRCH38 and its alt loci, uh, and those were taken and aligned together with uh, a tool called Cactus, which is uh, UC Santa Cruz's multiple alignment uh, tool that we use. It is really meant for whole genome alignment, but it can also do uh, alts against a reference. Uh, then I took that Cactus graph and we turned it into a graph. I mean, this, this, this multiple alignment, we turned it into a graph because they're sort of the same thing, right? A graph and a multiple alignment. Uh, and then on top of that graph, I layered uh, the point variants from 1,000 genomes and also a set of larger structural variants uh, derived from the 1,000 genomes project. Uh, and I combined across those two VCFs and combined that with the alts that were already in the graph to produce a better graph that had more variants in it and sort of validated that that was a possible thing to do and wrote some software that does that. Uh, and then I took that graph and I indexed it and sort of prepared it for alignment in the way that we would need to do to have an artifact that we could distribute that people could sort of download and use right away. Uh, and that was my uh, chromosome 22 variation map. Uh, so the results of my engineering work for that are uh, this HGVM builder tool uh, that I have up on GitHub and also I did some work on this Toil VG tool that we've been building in our lab that sort of attaches VG to our Toil workflow system and lets you run VG on a cluster or in the cloud to do uh, the various workflows that VG is sort of meant to support. Uh, I came up with a uh, sort of packaging mechanism for these graphs because when you have your, your graph reference, it's not just one file. You have the graph itself, which is a VG file, uh, but then you also have sort of an index of the graph where you can sort of do random access to nodes. 
uh, which is not really practical in the, in the normal protobuf format. Uh, so that has to be stored for alignment. Uh, and then there's another index that we use uh, for substring search, because when you're aligning, you have to do a lot of substring search. So there's another couple index files for that. Uh, and so I came up with this sort of way of dumping them all in a folder and slapping a manifest on it that includes a couple of uh, important pieces of information, like which of the paths correspond to references and which of the paths correspond to maybe samples or sort of other metadata that you have embedded. Uh, and it, it's all sort of plumbing work, but it's stuff that you need to sort out if you actually want people to be able to download and use this for analyses. Uh, then once I built this graph, I wanted to do some evaluations to show that it was actually a better reference for doing genomics than the linear references. Uh, so one of the analyses I came up with was this synthetic diploid evaluation. Uh, and so it's called a synthetic diploid evaluation because it involves sort of creating an imaginary diploid sample from two haploid samples. Uh, we have these two haploid samples, uh, CHM1 and CHM13. Uh, which are hyatidiform mole samples. They're sort of haploid cell lines that have been sequenced. And we have short reads from them, and we also have pack bio based assemblies from them, sort of for each. So you have a nice haploid assembly for the one sample and a nice haploid assembly for the other sample, and then a bunch of comparable short reads from both. Uh, so what I did was I pooled the short reads, or actually I think Glenn did the pooling for the short reads, uh, and I aligned those against the graph reference uh, using VG and got some alignments and then took those and did variant calling to generate a sample graph. And the sample graph described sort of the genotypes that the hypothetical diploid sample would have if CHM1 and CHM13 were sort of reads from its two haplotypes. Uh, then I took the assemblies uh, that come from these samples uh, I chopped them up into sort of longish chunks and I aligned those against the sample graph. Uh, and then I looked at these aligned fragments and I computed some, some metrics about how good those alignments were. Uh, so basically the idea is that you make this sample graph uh, doing variant calling using your HGVM graph as a reference. Then you take these sort of truth uh, assembly fragments and align them and you count up how many edits are needed to describe these fragments uh, on top of your variant called graph. So the better your HGVM reference is, the better your variant calls will be, and the better your sample graph will be in terms of how well it reflects the actual sort of structure of this hypothetical diploid sample. And so then when you realign these assembly fragments, they'll align better, there'll be fewer edits. And so basically the better your HGVM reference is, the fewer edits you have uh, to describe these assembly fragments. And so there are, there are sort of fewer modified bases. Uh, yeah, so fewer edits is better variant calling and a better reference. And I counted up how many edits of different types I have and that was sort of my metrics. Uh, and so you can see that here. Uh, I'm plotting just between the green, which is the control, which is uh, doing all this against sort of a linear reference graph, and the red, which is the HGVM, so starting with the HGVM graph and doing the variant calling and the, the sort of realignment. You can see that I have a lot fewer deletions uh, moving from the control to the HGVM, and also uh, many fewer, or uh, some fewer substitutions. So this tells me that I am sort of getting better performance out of the graph reference than you would get out of a linear reference. Uh, but we don't really see much of an effect in insertions. There's about the same number of insertions necessary to represent the sample as when you do the variant calling not against the, the graph, uh, which could be sort of because of our data sources. Maybe they don't include all the insertions that, that would actually be there. Um, and there's not really an improvement in sort of the number of soft clips, which I also thought ought to improve. Uh, so this is still sort of a work in progress. I'm still, like VG is still fixing up bugs, like Eric was telling you, and I'm still working on sort of engineering the pipeline so we can get an HGVM out that people would actually want to use. 
uh, I want a sort of a better variant collar. I think a better variant collar would sort of help this analysis because right now I'm looking at the variant collar and at the graph. Uh, I also want to uh, explain sort of more convincingly why we see improvements only in substitutions and deletions and not in insertions, where those sort of missing insertions have gotten to. Uh, and I also want to scale this up to the whole genome from sort of my test uh, run on chromosome 22, uh, where I've sort of been validating software. Uh, in conclusion, I'd like to acknowledge this very large screen full of people. And I will now take questions.